Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Jim's over here with you. We're glad you are with us to study God's Word tonight. Hope you will uh, get your Bibles and your pens and paper and take notes and uh, study along with us as we go through a, a lesson tonight. <clears throat> I want to uh, always give you our contact information. 276-340-2653 uh, is how you can reach me. A Word from the Lord at gmail.com. If you'd like to uh, uh, email Bible studies to me, be glad to do that very thing. Have a uh, uh, a few going on now uh, by e uh, email, and so we're good to hear from individuals who are watching on uh, outside of this area, in this area, and outside of this area. And we hope that you can, uh, that you will uh, benefit from uh, our lessons and our studies uh, from God's Word uh, along with us. We we hope you will take advantage of that very thing. Any information we have is free free to you if you just simply ask us for it. We offer a Bible correspondence course. If you'd like a Bible correspondence course, please. Uh, call me or email me. You can text me uh, and and give me uh, uh, some information where to send that to. We'll start sending that Bible correspondence out to you. It's free of charge. Just uh, have to simply just let us know where to send it. And uh, it's a good study, basic uh, study, uh, introduction to faith is what it's called. And so we'll uh, uh, be glad to send it out to you. Great, you send it back into us. We'll grade it and send you send you another one back. So. Uh, if we can assist you in any of that information, giving uh, any information to you, we'll be glad to do that very thing. <clears throat> I'm going to apologize in advance, getting over some sickness, so I know I'll be probably coughing and uh, hacking a little bit as, as we go through uh, tonight, so please, uh, please bear with me. But we're glad you're with us tonight. Tonight, <coughs> excuse me, tonight we're going to be talking about sanctuary cities. If you've been paying, paying attention to the news, um, at all, you know that this is something that's been talked about a great deal uh, here recently, especially as uh, politics heat up. But it has to do with individuals, uh, individual cities or cities uh, that have determined that they're going to provide sanctuary to individuals. And, <clears throat> and sanctuary cities, <coughs> excuse me, really refers to to a town or cities or counties that protect undocumented immigrants. Now, let's go ahead and say illegal immigrants uh, by refusing to cooperate completely with federal detention uh, requests, often with a don't ask, don't tell policy. So what happens is individuals come over here illegally and they commit crimes. And maybe they're, they're known felons, but these Sanctuary cities or towns or whatever will give them sanctuary. They will not inform the, uh, the federal authorities that they have a person in custody that is wanted on a felony charge, wanted for a federal uh, 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 crime, and so they just won't tell the, the federal uh, uh, authorities that they have them in custody, and they release them before the uh, federal authorities can, can uh, take uh, a possession of them, and this is this is what what's going on. This is a big problem. A lot of people have trouble problem with sanctuary cities because they do house or they do protect these uh, 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 these felons, these illegal immigrants that are committing uh, heinous crimes in, in in many cases heinous crimes, and yet they're they're protecting them under the guise of we want to protect them and take care of their rights. And here's, here's some examples of some of the cities and what they're doing. Uh, there's a number of cities, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, uh, even Austin, uh, Texas is, is one. There's, there's quite a few others. I'm sure there's some down in Florida. But this is, this is what, they're, what they're saying. I want to give you some examples of what people are saying. When they say they're going to be sanctuary cities and they're going to protect the criminals even if it means putting their own citizens in danger. Now, this is, this is a picture of Mayor de Blasio, uh, Mayor of New York, and this is what, uh, these are some things that are saying. Uh, here's an example of the kind of individuals that sanctuary cities are so-called protecting, giving sanctuary to. Now, this article talks about and cites a number of instances, individuals, uh, that have been released and the mayors or the officials that complain or that will oppose federal 
laws that would take these uh, felons in custody. Uh, here's an example. Estevan Rafael Marquis Velasquez, a gang member from El Salvador with a criminal record, was released from Rikers Island this year onto the streets of New York, New York before U.S. officers from the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, that's ICE, could a unit could pick him up for deportation proceedings. And there is Louis Alejandro uh, Viagras, uh, 31, who was released from local custody on December 31st, 2016, despite a detainer request from ICE. Uh, Viagras had previously been removed from the United States and has a prior conviction for forcible theft armed with a deadly weapon. And so these individuals, these criminals, heinous criminals, are being released before the federal authorities can come and take them uh, into custody. Now, in New York City suburb of Hempstead, here's an exa example, two women and a two-year-old girl ran out of luck. A MS-13 gang member who had been deported back to El Salvador, uh, who had been deported back to from El Salvador, from the U.S. four times and had a number of prior arrests, stabbed the women and sexually assaulted the little girl. Hampstead is in Nassau County, which is, in, which is a sanctuary jurisdiction. Hampstead's mayor, Wayne J. Hall Sr., said last February, President Trump's recent executive orders go against the moral fiber with which our great nation was built. And I, wholeheart and I wholeheartedly support New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio and countless other mayors throughout the United States as denouncing these acts. I, Mayor de Blasio, and leaders from many other communities throughout the country will work together to oppose these executive orders and protect the rights of all people. Now think about that. We're going to oppose executive orders, federal laws that, that violate the rights of all people. So he's going to say we're going to put the rights of these criminals, a gang member, above the rights of the two people that he stabbed and sexually molested, or three people that he stabbed and sexually molested. Does that just make sense to you folks? Now, when you hear things like that, I don't know about you, but when I hear things like that, it just... It makes me scream, what is going on in this world? The idea that someone is giving sanctuary to these kind of individuals and are saying, well, we're going to put, they have rights too. If you're a criminal and you're sexually molesting little girls and you're stabbing people, you're a, you're a violent gang member, you don't have rights, number one, as a citizen, because you're, you're a, cr a criminal, and number two, they're not even a, cr a, a citizen. But yet this is what sanctuary cities bring us. They give protection uh, t uh, and a covering to some of the most wicked and vile uh, uh, people in the country. Let's read on. Chicago's Mayor Rahm Emanuel, used to work for uh, President Obama, who is presiding over a city beset with rampant crime, reiterated his pledge that Chicago will, quote, continue to welcome immigrants. Now, friends, listen. When someone says that, that protecting violent criminals are, or excuse me, it, when someone says that uh, deporting or detaining violent criminals goes against our moral fiber, I wonder what in the world are we coming to? What kind of mindset says we have a moral fiber that would oppose protecting innocent people and would protect the criminals? Is that really what we want to continue doing? But here's another mayor, Rahm Emanuel, continuing to welcome immigrants. It's not about welcoming immigrants. It's about deporting and protecting the citizens who are here from individuals who are illegal and who are already felons and criminals and who have shown that they are committing these heinous crimes. So they want to make it a statement, well, this is against uh, immigrants. No, 
It's not against immigrants. It's against people who violate the law, who break the law. He goes on to say, Chicago was built on the back of immigrants, and our future is hitched to the wagon of immigrants who come to the city. Was Chicago and was this nation built upon the backs of immigrants who came in, robbed, stole, killed, murdered, maimed? Is that, is that the kind of immigrants that this country was built upon? Now, yeah, that you say, well, there's all kinds of crime. Listen, let's don't let's don't nitpick. Let's don't let's don't make a blanket statement about uh, about the moral purity of this country. Yes, there were heinous crimes going on, but the individuals that we're talking about protecting with these sanctuary cities are not the kind of people that build up a society. And I think anybody in their right mind knows this. So what what uh, purpose do sanctuary cities provide? How, how is it benefiting society? Listen, 45 out of the 48 illegal immigrants that were picked up in a raid last uh, uh, month in Chicago, this is just talking about last month in Chicago, uh, had previously been convicted of crimes, including criminal sexual assault. 20 of those individuals uh, had, re had returned to the country after they had already been deported. Now think about that. So 45 of the 48 people, uh, illegal immigrants that were picked up in a raid last month in Chicago, 45 of them had already had a criminal uh, record, and 20 of those, so nearly half of those 45, had already been deported once, and they were back in the country. And we're going to say, well, we've got to give them sanctuary. We've got to give them some shelter. We've got to give them some protection. We could go on and talk about in, in San Francisco back before, uh, back last year. This was being talked about during all the political campaign. Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez, an undocumented immigrant, that, read that, illegal immigrant, had seven felony convictions in the United States and had been deported from the country five times. Seven convictions, deported five times, and here he was back in San Francisco, a sanctuary city, because San Francisco declined to detain him for immigration and customs enforcement officials and released him into the community. In July 2015, Lopez Sanchez was charged with murdering Katie Steinle uh, in San Francisco, the sanctuary city provided protection for the criminal, the seven-time uh, seven convicted felon, five-time deported felon, and was providing sanctuary so that he could kill again. Friends, something is backwards when you talk about a sanctuary city providing this kind of protection to the most heinous people in society. Now, that ought to outrage you. What kind, of, what kind of people are these that would give protection to this? Let's go on and give some statistics here. Notice this. In the United States, illegal immigrants in the United States make up approximately 3.5%. Now, think about that. 3.5% make up uh, the United States population. That's not very much. That's not very much. All right? According to data compiled from the U.S. Sentencing Commission, for fiscal year 2015, uh, illegal immigrants were responsible for 30.2% of convictions for kidnapping and hostage taking. So 3% of the population, of that, 30% of the kidnapping and hostage taking came from that 3%. Wow. Wow. And then it's a 17.8% of convictions for drug trafficking, almost 12% of convictions for fraud, 10% of convictions for money laundering, 6% of convictions from assault, and 5.5% of convictions for murder. Now you think about that. This is all coming from the 3.2% of the population in our country that's illegal. And now we've got cities like San Francisco, Chicago, New York, uh, there's others, uh, Austin, that are, that are saying we're going to provide sanctuary for these people because we, we don't like the federal laws. We think the federal laws are the ones that, that violate their rights. So we're going to protect the illegal, violent criminals 
at the expense of putting our own citizens in jeopardy. Now, friends, does that, does that bother you? That ought to make you go, you know what? This is, this is terrible. For sanctuary cities to harbor these criminals, provide them with sanctuary, provide them with protection, and not enforce federal laws, especially in regard to individuals that have already been convicted of felons, have already been convicted of, of, of these crimes, and they're going to give them a pass. And so they make illegal immigration and they make a law breaking attractive to people. They, they make it to where people say, well, you know, if I just get, if I get to the United States, I can go to one of these sanctuary cities. I can do what I want to. And I may spend a few time, a little bit in jail, but you know what? All in all, I'm going to be free to go again because even if they deport me, I can come back and I can stay in these sanctuary cities. And they're not going to turn me into the federal uh, 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 agencies. So what are they doing? They're making a mockery of the rule of law. It makes, it, it, it makes them, they, they laugh in the face of the rules and the laws that should make a society great. Now, the reason I'm talking about sanctuary cities, which well, has what does that have to do with the Bible? I want to, I want to demonstrate this. If this makes you aghast, it just makes you jaw drop. If it makes you go, what in the world are these people thinking harboring criminals and making uh, crime attractive, making law breaking attractive, making these crimes something that you, yeah, hey, let's let's do it. Let's. There's no consequence to these crimes. Why shouldn't we do this? It ought to it ought to make you furious, friends. It ought to make you go. You know what? This is this is crazy. These people, Mayor De Blasio, these mayors and these and these uh, uh, lawmakers that are saying we're going to protect these people, they ought to be they ought to be thrown out of the country. They ought to be thrown out of office. They are making our country terrible. That's exactly right. I hope you, I hope it outrages you. But the reason why I bring this up because I want you to see here's the same principle. Do you realize, friends, that denominations denominations do the same thing? that these sanctuary cities do? They are like these sanctuary cities. Here's why I say that. Because just as the sanctuary cities provide protection to the lawbreakers and make lawbreaking attractive and make it where there's no consequences for the criminal acts, that's what the denominations do. They're just like these sanctuary cities because they give shelter to the lawless and the disobedient. You say, what do you mean, James? What do you mean the lawless? Look at this. In Matthew 7 and verse 24, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20, 23, excuse me. Listen to what the Bible says. Matthew 7 and verse 23. Jesus says, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew ye. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That word iniquity is the word for illegality. They're outlaws. Jesus says, depart from me, you outlaws, you folks that work iniquity, that engage in illegal conduct. Individuals who violate the commands of God are workers of iniquity. They're outlaws. They don't want to be restrained. They don't want to be held back. They don't want to be told, well, you can't do certain things. And friends, let me tell you, that's exactly what these denominations do. And you say, well, James, that's, that's a far stretch. No, that's exactly right. Just think about it. Just think about all the times that you hear people in the religious world going, well, we can't judge that person. Even though they're living in sin, we can't judge them. We can't condemn them. The, the man that called in on Cato's program, I was, just, I was over there just rolling my eyes. I could not believe what was being said. But see, that's, a, that's the way sanctuary cities are set up. They want to justify the lawless. They want to justify the criminals. They want to justify the individuals that are willfully, openly rebelling against God. You know, it reminds me of, of in Jeremiah's day. In Jeremiah's day, <clears throat> you had individuals, you had individuals who uh, did not want to do what God said. I want you to notice this. Uh, in Jeremiah uh, 44, 
Jeremiah 44 and verse 15. Listen to what the record says. Here it says, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense and other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers and our kings and our princes uh, in the city of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals and were well uh, and were well and saw no evil. We are not going to do what you said. And we're going to do what everybody previously says. Our fathers and the kings and the princes and the cities of Judah. See, they were in open rebellion to God and they said, we're just not going to do what God says. Well, that's what the sanctuary cities do. They look at the Bible. They look at what God says and they go, we're not going to do that. We are not going to do what the Bible says. I want you to give you an example. Here's a good example of how sanctuary cities only lead to promoting more crime. Sanctuary cities in the religious world promote more sin. Look at this. This is, this is a heading from an article. Archbishop of Wales. We have evolved from the Bible's teaching on divorce. Why not on gay marriage? Now think about that. We have evolved from what the Bible talked about divorce. Well, we need to evolve some more. We let one sin go. Why don't we just do something else? Why don't we let another sin go? See how it is? See how it's promoted? Look at this. <coughs> Excuse me. The Anglican Church's views have evolved and changed on the nature of marriage, a subject which Jesus pronounced very clearly, the head of the Anglican Church in Wales said this week, therefore it can also change its teaching on homosexuality. Now friends, if you can't see, if you can't see how churches, denominations, how they take liberty with the higher laws of God's word are just like the sanctuary cities that reject and ignore and overlook and, and determine that they are going to uh, disregard the higher laws of the federal government when it comes to things like crime, then friends, I, you may get to heaven on a baby ticket if you can't see that. That's exactly what they're doing. You see, here's the principle. The principle is when you ignore the laws that, uh, that are moral and just, then all you're doing is you're promoting the immoral and the unjust. You're promoting the ungodly. And here is the head of the Anglican Church saying, well, we've, we've evolved on what Jesus said, and it was clear that Jesus said, Jesus had very clear pronouncements on the subject of marriage, and we've evolved from that. Well, why don't we just do the same thing on homosexuality? Notice he says, the state allowed the possibility of divorce and remarriage for a long time before we did as a church. Not only do we now bless such unions, we actually remarry divorced persons in our churches, he said. I can't believe it when I hear people talking like this. We ignored what Jesus said over here. Well, why can't we ignore what Jesus said over here? Isn't that just like the sanctuary cities? They're providing sanctuary to individuals that are in open rebellion to God's law. We're going to ignore what Jesus said on marriage, which is very clear, as he, as he said. Look, in Matthew 19, in Matthew 19, Jesus said, Have you not read, Matthew 94, have you not read that he which made them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What well, therefore God had joined together, let not man put asunder. Now that's pretty clear. 
And the, and the head of the Anglican church actually admitted, this is clear teaching on marriage, but we're going to ignore it. We're going to ignore it. We're going to be like those mayors in these sanctuary cities. We're going to ignore the higher law. And we're going to say, well, we can make, we can make uh, loopholes and rules and regulations. We can change it. I mean, after all, after all, the state was allowing the possibility of divorce for a long time before we had recognized it. Well, hello, if you are true to the Bible, which I know the Anglican Church is not, but if they were true to the Bible, they wouldn't be looking at the state as the standard for what they should be doing when it comes to marriage and divorce. They should be looking to the Bible. Therein lies the problem. Individuals are going, well, you know what, this is the book, but we're going to ignore it. We're going to look and see what the state's doing. The state says people can marry and divorce. Therefore, we ought to let, this, let, we ought to let, let people marry and divorce. The state doesn't care, so we shouldn't care. Hello? It is the church responsibility of individuals who are following the Bible to make the government conform to what is righteous and just according to God's standard, not look at the, at the state and say, well, we're going to conform God's standard to what the government says. So the bottom line is you have people in religion who then wind up just giving sanctuary to the lawless, the workers of iniquity. Friend, do you realize that the Bible clearly says that Adultery and uh, uh, fornication is contrary to God's law and divorce for any reason other than what Christ gave in Matthew 19, 9 is actually, is actually violating God's law and therefore is making criminals workers of iniquity, outlaws out of individuals when they say, well, go ahead and do it. Here's what Jesus said. He said, what God joined together, let not man put us under. But man comes along and says, well, you can put it under all you want to. No, you can't. Not in God's eyes. In God's eyes, you're still bound together. Listen, a man and a woman who have never been married and they marry, the only thing that's going to put them asunder is fornication. The only other thing is death. In any other case, they're staying together. If they get separated, if they divorce because she burnt a toast and he won't pick up, the, pick up his dirty clothes, guess what? In God's eyes, they're still together. And anybody that comes along and says, well, divorce for any reason, all you're doing is you're harboring, you're giving sanctuary to the outlaws when it comes to those who are... Uh, Failing to adhere to God's law here. They said Moses, now notice what they said to Jesus. They said, Moses commanded to give away a rising divorcement and put her away. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. It was not God's intent. He said, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now you know what? When you, when you say, well, I want to give you a pass on this. When the preacher, the pastor, the bishop, or the rabbi, whoever it may be, says, I want to give you a pass, even though I know you're in direct violation of what God says, you are given sanctuary to an outlaw. And it's no different than Mayor de Blasio or the mayor of, of San Francisco or Chicago saying to the, the felon who just murdered people and raped people, well, we're going to give you a pass too. We're not going to turn you in. Sanctuary churches. Sanctuary cities are sanctuary churches. Take your pick. They're just the same. They're doing the same thing. They are giving a pass and protection to individuals who are in willful disobedience to God. This article goes on to say about the, uh, about the Anglican Church. Some people, this is the, the head of the Anglican Church, some people have changed their minds, for example, on women's ministry and same-sex relationships when they have experienced the ministry of a woman, priest, in one case, or discovered their own son or daughter to be gay in the other. 
Well, let's think about that. Now, isn't that the way it works in the sanctuary cities? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Somebody I know is involved in a crime, therefore, it's not a crime anymore. Somebody that I know is involved in therefore, we're going to change the meaning of it. Friends, that's exactly what we're talking about. That's exactly where people start giving protection to individuals who are willfully uh, disobeying God. They're breaking God's law. And men come along and go, well, that's my son or that's my daughter. Therefore, I'm going to give them a pass. No, you're providing sanctuary to a criminal. In the eyes of man's law, if that, had been, if that was a criminal and you were harboring them, you'd be harboring a felon. Right? You could be charged for harboring a felon, someone that's wanted. But yet in God, according to in the religious world, man comes along and says, well, we're going to let homosexuality uh, pass because after all, my son and my daughter are homosexual. We're going to live marriage and divorce. We're going to rethink it because after all, my son and my daughter, now they're divorced. Friends, it doesn't matter if, if your mom or your daddy, sister, brother involved in these things. It's still a sin. And for you to say God's law doesn't matter is to provide sanctuary to a criminal. You're part of a, of a sanctuary church. When the preacher says, I'm not going to ask you any questions about your marriage or your divorce situation, you know what he's doing? He, he, he just turned that denomination into a sanctuary church. But really, that's what they are to start with because they're all in open rebellion. This man goes on to say, will we as a church, and he's talking about the Anglican church here, will we as a church eventually adopt the same approach as far as same-sex relationships are concerned as we have done about marriage and div uh, after divorce? Or is gay marriage a different category from the, uh, from the remarriage of divorced people? He's asking the question, are we going to change? Well, you know they're going to change. You know they're going to change. Well, they've, they've ignored God's law on marriage and divorce. Why wouldn't they change on God's law when it comes to homosexual marriage? See what I'm talking about, friends? When you start, when you start giving a, a pass <clears throat> or you start giving sanctuary to criminals of one sin, then pretty soon you're going to have to give sanctuary to the criminals of another sin. When you start saying, well, one sin is okay, then you have to say another sin is okay. Where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? Where do you say, uh, when do you say enough is enough? He says, he says, Holy Scripture itself is far more nuanced and subtle and complex than we often realize. Well, you just said it was pretty plain. Now you're saying, well, it's subtle and it's nuanced. And you had to, you know, you had to be kind of, you had to kind of tiptoe around there. You might get it wrong. He says, we cannot just quote biblical texts on different subjects, subject matters, and think that that settles an issue. It is easy to opt for prohibitions in Scripture and regard them as the word of the Lord and forget that the Bible contains stories which also convey God's word to us. What do you mean we can't just quote biblical text on different subject matters and think that that settles it? Hello? I thought that's the what, exactly what it was. The Bible is what settles it. Listen, if we can't go to the Bible and say this is what settles a matter, then what are, we, what are we using the Bible for? Why are you even touting the Bible? Why are you even holding up the Bible? Why are you even using the Bible as, as any kind of source material? Why not just use it for a doorstop? It's obviously that you're not using it for anything else. Just use it for a doorstop to let any kind of criminal, sinful criminal walk in. The homosexual, the adulterer, the fornicator, the gambler, the drunkard, whatever it is, just let them all in and use the Bible for a doorstop because you're not paying attention to the laws anyway. See, that's the problem. Our sanctuary cities, secularly speaking, in the world, sanctuary cities don't pay any regard, any pay attention to any, to any uh, federal law. They don't pay attention to the Constitution. They say, we're not going to enforce it. We're not going to do it. 
We're going to let everybody have a pass. We don't care what the federal government says. Now, if you listen to me, you know that I, I think the federal government oversteps a whole lot. But in regard to the rule of law and protecting our borders and protecting our citizens from criminals, if you ignore what the law says and it's a righteous law or a just law, then you are protecting the criminal and harming the innocent. And that's the way churches are, friends. Tell me what innocent person you're helping by saying that a person who is involved in sin or lives in sin should be given a pass. Who are you helping? Who are you helping? Who does it help to say we're going to give the homosexual a pass? Who does it help? That young boy, young girl, that's sitting there listening to the preacher, the preacher says, well, we can't judge the homosexual. Is that really helping them? Because then they grow up and they hear, well, it must not be wrong. The preacher never condemned it. It must not be wrong. We were never told it was wrong. We're going to do it. Are you really helping the innocent people? Are you protecting them? Or are you opening the door and inviting them if nothing else, because you didn't say anything about it, are you inviting them to participate in it? Listen, if you don't, if you don't want to say that homosexuality is a sin, and you don't want to say that gambling is wrong, you don't want to talk about the dangers of drinking and the dangers of drugs, you don't want to preach against that and the, and the harm of, of uh, premarital sex and the harm of fornication and adultery and all the diseases that come with being promiscuous, you don't want to talk about that then don't complain when the innocent people who are listening to you say, well, anything goes. And you wonder, why are our kids so caught up in drugs and alcohol and sex? Why are they caught up in the worldliness? Why are they going away and just uh, being more like the world? You know why? Because you didn't say anything was wrong. You're providing sanctuary for the very things that now you're wishing your children were participating in. Sanctuary churches. Starts with this attitude right here. Well, you can't just quote the Bible as if that's the, that's the final authority that's going to settle the matter. Really? See the mom said? The mom said, well, God's law doesn't matter. Now, you really want to tell me, friends, you really want to tell me that individuals who have this mindset aren't really promoting and pushing the same mentality that the sanctuary cities that are hurting our country are promoting and pushing? Say the same thing. Same thing. The head of the Anglican Church says, Jesus, he added, had nothing to say about gay marriage as the archbishop counseled homosexuals to be patient with regard to the Anglican Church's attitude toward homosexuality. Just be patient. Jesus didn't say anything about, about gay marriage, so just be patient. We'll change and we'll let you in. Think about that, friends. Think of what he's saying. Jesus didn't say anything about gay marriage. Open your Bible. Find the words in red where Jesus said gay marriage is sin. You won't find it. He's right. Jesus did not say anything specifically about gay marriage. He did say something about marriage. We just read that in Matthew 19. Man and woman. Now that's not man and man. That's not woman and woman. So he did say something about marriage. He so, said, well, he didn't say anything specifically about gay marriage. Okay, he didn't. I'll give you that. Let's say that. He did not say anything specifically about gay marriage. But you know what he did say? He did say something through his apostles. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37, he said, First Corinthians 14, verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So whatever Paul wrote was the commandments of the Lord. So what did the Lord command by the Apostle Paul? 
1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, look what Paul says. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Right there, there's the homosexuals. So Jesus may not have specifically and explicitly said something about homosexuals, but his apostle did. And he said that the effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So while Jesus may not have specifically said something, his apostle did say something about it, and he says they won't get to heaven. But you know what? It doesn't really matter if Jesus said something about homosexual marriage or not. It doesn't really matter if Jesus said something about gay marriage or not because we've already demonstrated, and he's clearly already said that even though Jesus specifically and plainly and very clearly said something about marriage, and divorce, you've already acknowledged that you're going to disregard it. So why would it matter if Jesus said something about gay marriage or not? You're going to ignore it too. Why? Because you're providing a sanctuary church. You're providing a haven for the immoral, the ungodly, the rebelling against God. That's what you're providing. And friends, let me tell you, denominations, not just the Anglican church, but all denominations are the same way. You say, well, James, you can't lump all denominations into the same category as you can the Anglican Church. Oh, yes, I can. I certainly can. You know why? Because all denominations have the same mentality. They give sanctuary to the fornicators, the adulterers, the fornicators, the drunkards, the homosexuals. You just name it. And they're in there. How do I know? Well, look at this. Look at Galatians 5, verse 19. Galatians 5 and verse 19. I'm just going to go through some of these. Some of these, some of these things that are listed here, you may not know. Uh, you had to do a good word study on them. Some of these are kind of old words that you won't recognize necessarily what they mean. But some of them you will. And let's just go through and look at some of these. And you tell me if you find this kind of individual in the church where you are. I guarantee you you'll find at least one of these individuals in every denomination out there. Adultery. Well, we could just stop right there and go all night, couldn't we? We stop right there and go all night. Churches that have adulterers living in them. Actively involved in them. Now, if they know that this person is living in adultery and they don't put them out from among them, which is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, you know what they're doing? They're providing sanctuary for them. It's a sanctuary church. Now, Tim Whitehart, Caleb was talking about Tim Whitehart. A year fornicating with the flute player. Can you tell me, can you tell me that he wasn't given sanctuary? And all the people that came to his defense, oh, he's a good man. Yeah, he just fell. Yeah, he fell. Uh, I can't think of the, the preacher's name up there that was called Keith. Oh, yeah, well, Tim, yeah, T Tim fell. You know, he, he just backslid. He back backslid. Now, he can't fall in order to, be, to lose his salvation, according to uh, most of the Baptists. So what did he do? Either he wasn't really saved, is what some of them will say, or he's still going to get to heaven, but boy, he was, he, he's walking on the edge right there. He, he's walking on the edge. He could, he could have been on the way to hell, but no, I think he's just going to pass right by, you know. He just took a little detour. He wasn't going straight to heaven. He was going to take a detour down there and get a little sunburn, suntan down there at hell, but he's, he's still on the way to heaven. Really? The conversation that was being... Uh, had uh, last hour on this very uh, subject was amazing to me. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe all the way we're going to tiptoe around it without saying you have to sin. All right? So sanctuary, sanctuary churches, you on the word from the Lord? Yeah, I'm guessing the reason everybody in your church is perfect 
is probably the reason nobody's there. Well, one re- one thing, I don't have a church. All right, number no, one. No, number sir, one. No, 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 no. You, you got to say your piece. I don't have a church. Number one, and number two. Sure. Everybody in the church that I'm a member of is not perfect, sinlessly perfect. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, you're just standing there saying they are perfect. I didn't. You don't. I, I didn't you don't say sinlessly perfect. Idolaters. I didn't say sinlessly perfect, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I did sir. not say sinlessly perfect. It's, See, it's, the problem. The problem that you have, sir, is you think that since you can't be sinlessly perfect, then you got you can be a vile sinner and still get to heaven. But the Bible clearly says, no, sir, that, no, sir. I, I I know I'm a sinner. I sin every day, just as you do. Okay, so what's your point? My point is, you're, you're standing there saying that everybody in your church is perfect. There, there's no adulterers in your church. No, there, I don't no, have a church, but there church. are no adulterers Absolutely. in the Lord's church. Not where I am. Absolutely. That's there, exactly what you're standing there saying. I, I, that's exactly what I'm saying. I there are no, there are no, uh, there are no adulterers in the Lord's church where I'm a member of. No, you're exactly right. There are none. Yes, sir, there are. Uh, name one of them. I don't have to name them. The Lord knows them. They're, they're not adulterers. There, there are not any adulterers. I know everybody in, in the congregation I'm a member of. And you know exactly how they live their lives. I'm I know sure. they're not adulterers. Oh, no. no, no, Nobody cheats on their spouses in your church. No. It's not my church, but no, they don't. Like I said. So, so what you're saying, but you're saying you won't, you won't tell them to quit living in adultery. You're saying just go ahead and have a pass. Is that right? Can you get to heaven living in adultery? Can you get to heaven committing adultery? You can, you can get to heaven. Can you can't get to heaven without asking forgiveness? No, of your no, 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 no. We didn't say nothing about forgiveness. You said actively involved in adultery. So can you get to heaven being an adulterer? You're living in adultery. Can you get to heaven? If you ask for forgiveness, yes, I didn't know you didn't say ask for forgiveness. We're not talking about asking for forgiveness, sir. We're talking about people is it, is who are committing about, adultery. What getting, getting into heaven is for? Sir, listen. You're saying, you think that if someone commits a sin, they're always a sinner. I am not a sinner. No, sir. E- no, e- sir. E- not what I'm saying. Then how, do you, then how can you live in adultery and still get to heaven? Because you ask for forgiveness. That's what you do. If you ask for forgiveness, that then you stop. If person. you ask for forgiveness, then you stop. Sir, if you ask for forgiveness, then you stop sinning. Now, if you ask for forgiveness, I, if I, you I, ask for forgiveness I, from, I, from I adultery, if you ask for forgiveness for committing adultery, do you continue commit adultery? No, no, no. Okay, you're, then. You're asking for forgiveness is pretty worthless at that point. Would it not be correct? Asking for forgiveness for committing adultery? Is worthless? No. No. It is if you keep committing adultery. Okay. So that so so why are we arguing here? I'm saying I'm, I'm saying the person who does not, not ask for forgiveness. I'm not arguing. I'm having a discussion the, with you because the, the, I've sat and watched you guys. The, the person sir, the person that continues to commit adultery, is he going to get to heaven? If he keeps doing it, yes. Okay, so so you're and I'm saying now, if there's a person in your church, in the church where you're a member of, and you know this guy, you know your friend over here, your buddy over here, he's he's shacking up, he's running around with his wife. Are you going to tell him to stop? Or are you going to give him a pass? I'm going to tell him to stop. Absolutely. Okay, For that's one, what I'm doing. If he, if he keeps, no. But I, but here's the thing, sir. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. You're standing there saying that there's not those kind of people in your church. I don't have a church, and there's not those kind of people. Yes, there is. No, there's not. How do you know? How, how do you know there is? If, if, how how do you know? Th- how do you know there is? If I say there's not, it's when they leave on Sunday. You don't know what they do when they leave on Sunday. They might go make moonshine, sir. You don't know that. I know. I know, that that? There are, I know there are no people. There are no adulterers in the church where I'm a member. You're a moron. You're an absolute moron. Well. Okay. If you, do you hang out with every one of those people in your congregation? Do they all go to your house after church Sunday? No. No, they don't. They all go their separate ways. But I find it interesting. go to bars. Half of them not I, go to whorehouses. You oh, really? Know. All right. Now, that may be the where you go to church. Where do you go to church? Because that may be where... No, we're not talking about my church. I'm not the one standing up there saying there are no sinners okay. in my church. Okay, okay. But you're saying it's okay if they do. No, I'm you're not saying, saying, saying it's okay if they do. If they do. 
my whole point of this phone call is to call you and tell you that there are those people in your church which you are but saying you don't know. there is not. But you don't know. That's you don't point. know anybody. You don't know anybody that's a member of the church where I am. You don't know that. I just asked you no to name idea. one. I said, name someone who's a member of the church where I am who's an adulterer. So you honestly think that I would put someone's name out there who may be doing wrong, who may need counseled, who doesn't need their name all over the airwaves. Well, you seem to know You seem that's to know everybody in, the, in the church. That's where, the way you... You seem to know everybody. But, but here's what I'm saying, sir. Exactly. I'm giving you examples of preachers and individuals who are in denominations that are given a pass when they're living in adultery. Oh, sir. And, and therefore, it must be they're given sanctuary. How do you know they're given a pass? And I'm saying when people are you, are in the you Lord's Jesus church, himself? in the Lord's church, Jesus is the only one that gives a in, pass, not you. Sir, in the Lord's church, a pass. in the Lord's church, when someone is overtaken in a fault, they are restored, they're corrected, they're rebuked and admonished. That's how you restore them. Now, I'm saying individuals who are not told that adultery is wrong or they're fornicating, they're shacking up, and they're, and they're not told to stop by the preachers are given a pass. Now, you're talking about all these people that go whoring and drinking and everything after church. Now, that may be where you are, may be the church where you go to, but it's not in the church that I'm a member of. I don't go to your church. You don't know that. That's what I'm saying. That's my whole point of this phone call. You don't know who I am. You don't know. But you're standing there saying well, like you, don't, you know no, and you I'm don't saying, know. I'm giving examples of... Con- I'm, all right. Thanks for your call. <clears throat> I'm giving examples. I'm giving examples, friends, of, of these churches that have all these kind of people. That, you know, I was out door knocking the other day and met a fellow, and he said he got so tired of going to churches, he said, because he went, walked in, and he said, I know all the people. He said... He said, before I got saved, he said, I, they would get me to go buy them beer after church. He said, because they didn't want to be seen going to get it. Now, friends, there's no one like that in the Lord's church where I'm a member of. And if there is someone like that, if you were to tell me, I would go talk to that brother or that sister. But to say, for, for this man to come up and say, well, there's fornicators and adulterers and everybody in the, in the church of Christ in Eden. Oh, no, there's not. Oh, no, there's not. So, now, if you, if you think you know someone, you want to make an accusation against them, hey, bring it on. But I'm telling you, these are the congregations, the denominations that allow it. You know all these preachers, they're not going to preach against uh, a fornication. All their people are going, like the man said. He said, well, there's no one in your church. Well, why? Because I'm going to tell them that fornicating and adultery is wrong. They don't want to stay unless they're going to correct it. But yeah, they'll, they'll, I guarantee you they'll go over to Osborne Baptist. They'll go to some of the big churches. Yeah. Will Robinson, yeah, he formed, uh, adulterer. Had the Holy Ghost while he was committing adultery. Is that, is that all right? How was that, how was that even possible? How was that even possible? Well, must have been in Saint, one of those sanctuary churches. The other day we were out door knocking. One of the, a member of the Baptist church pushed Mark McMinnis. Mark and I will get on talking about that. Uh, maybe next week. I don't know. We'll get together. We'll discuss that. But what kind of people? That's a railer. That's what the Bible talks about, a railer. Now, a brute. Those are the kind of people that are in denomination, friends. Now, you won't find those kind of people in the Lord's church. And that's why I say denominations are sanctuary churches. They're full of lawless and disobedient people. And the reason I know that they may not be adulterers and fornicators or drunkards, but you know what they are? They are disobedient to God because they haven't obeyed Him. If they had been obedient to Him, they'd be in the Lord's church, not in the Baptist church, or the Methodist church, or the Presbyterian church, or the Lutheran church. I know they're lawless and disobedient because God says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he believeth not shall be damned. And a Baptist preacher won't preach that. And a member of the Baptist church hasn't done that. So that's why I know that they're disregarding what God says. They might not necessarily be the, the vile, the, the bad sinner, like the adulterers and the fornicators, but I guarantee you, they're disobeying what God says. And that's why they're part of these sanctuary churches. They're, think they're going to give everybody security and safety when really they're just being lawless and disobedient when they come to God. Friends, I'm out of time. 
I'd like to uh, have a, few, a little more to say about the Lord's Church, but here's where we are, friends. We're talking to you about the true sanctuary, which is the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ. We don't house the ungodly. We don't give sanctuary to the ungodly. We give sanctuary and protection to the innocent, the citizens that want to serve God and be obedient to Him. Friends, if we can help you in any way, we'd like, like to hear from you at wordfromthelord.gmail.com. 276-340-2653. Until next time, thanks for watching. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.